buenas tardes a, a todos. Gracias por, por acompañarnos en esta eh, sesión abierta de nuestro seminario universitario de la cuestión social. Eh, es muy satisfactorio y diría que honroso tener en esta ocasión como ponente al profesor David Gordon. Eh, David es profesor de Justicia Social y Pobreza en la Universidad de Bristol, en el Reino Unido, y es eh, reconocido como la principal autoridad en el estudio de la pobreza con el enfoque de Peter Townsend de privación relativa. Ha dedicado David más de 30 años al análisis internacional de la pobreza multidimensional, y ha contribuido de manera muy importante con medidas globales de pobreza multidimensional infantil para la UNICEF, la medida oficial de pobreza multidimensional de la Unión Europea y fue miembro del grupo Río de Naciones Unidas para medición de la pobreza y asesor decisivo para el diseño de la medida oficial de pobreza multidimensional mexicana. Sus aportaciones han sido tales que en 2018 la, académica, la Academia Británica de Ciencias lo hizo miembro, que es un logro máximo en las ciencias sociales en el Reino Unido. David, welcome again. Eh, y, y le hemos pedido a nuestro amigo y distinguido colega Gonzalo Hernández Lecona que inicie como acostumbramos, la ronda de comentarios, preguntas y demás, eh, con una intervención. Eh, Gonzalo, muchas gracias. gracias. Gonzalo, eh, ustedes, muchos de ustedes lo conocen, ha estado con nosotros en, en diferentes ocasiones. Eh, es doctor en Economía por la Universidad de Oxford, en Inglaterra, y tiene una maestría en Economía en la Universidad de Essex, también en Inglaterra, y la licenciatura en Economía por el Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México. Gonzalo fue secretario ejecutivo del Coneval y es miembro del Comité Editorial de la revista Economía Mexicana, publicada por el CIDE, y es obviamente también miembro del Sistema Nacional de Investigadores. Bienvenido, Gonzalo, como siempre. Gracias. Well, we'll listen to you, David. Good evening and thank you all for coming. Can you hear me? I'm going to talk in English because my Spanish is too terrible to inflict upon you. Uh, I'm going to uh, give some reflections on the Sustainable Development Goals. Is this working? Ah, okay. So, I'm sure you're all familiar that with the Sustainable Development Goals. In 2015, uh, the governments of all the countries who are members of the United Nations agreed on 17 goals, uh, which included 169 targets and hundreds of indicators, uh, which were meant to guide social, economic, and environmental policy up to 2030. So there are very important goals, that, <laughs> the first one of which is to eradicate poverty. So, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals aren't the first set of international agreements. They were a follow-on from the Millennium Development Goals, which had far fewer targets. And as you can see, the final evaluation of the Millennium Development Goals, about half of the targets were met, and about half of them were failed to be met. So the way these goals were set was that they looked, some civil servants looked through the international agreements that there had been up to the year 2000, they looked at the trends from 1990 to 2000, and then they extrapolated what would happen in 2015 if those trends continued. So arguably they were not particularly ambitious, 
and you would expect with those kinds of methodologies, you would get about half successful and half unsuccessful. So there was some debate in the academic literature about whether those Millennium Development Goals made any difference. Can I have the next slide? Okay. So, one of the reasons... Has they gone? Okay. One of the reasons that some of those goals were met was the massive growth in China. China, according to Chinese government statistics, met every single one of the Millennium Development Goals, and that improved the world as a whole because the China has so many uh, populations. Okay, so the Sustainable Development Goals were negotiated by uh, responses from millions of people around the world. So they were very ambitious and very democratic. Millennium Development Goals weren't done like that at all. They were basically developed by two civil servants, uh, Jan van der Mutele and uh, Michael Dole, who drew up this agenda, which was then agreed uh, in 1999. So in some ways, the Sustainable Development Goals have much more legitimacy than the Millennium Development Goals, and hopefully that will be one of their strengths. They have uh, civil society support, whereas the Millennium Development Goals really didn't have that kind of process. Okay. So, uh, Jan van der Mutele is a critical friend of the Sustainable Development Goals because he designed the uh, um, Millennium Development Goals, and he argues that the SDGs are not really a global agenda. He said Agenda 2030 is not universal in scope because the few targets that are verifiable, those that contain conceptual clarity and numerical outcomes and specific deadlines, apply primarily to developing countries. Whereas in re the idea behind the SDGs where they should apply to rich countries like my own in the United Kingdom, equally as to poor countries like uh, Bangladesh or Uganda. So he argues the SDGs are not fit for purpose to address the dual, dual challenges of environmental sustainability and high inequality. And in my talk, I'm going to concentrate on those two particular aspects because there are major global trends which, uh, in terms of the environmental change, in terms of inequality, which the Sustainable Development Goals are designed to turn around, but will be very difficult. Okay, so the latest report on the Sustainable Development Goals uh, from 2019 makes some fairly depressing reading. There are some major thing improvements, but there are also some major problems. So when the report was released, uh, the UN argued that there is increasing inequality among and within countries, which requires urgent attention. The year 2018 was the fourth warmest year on record. The warming trend continues. Uh, the pace of poverty reduction is starting to decelerate and uh, it is going down so low that the target of eradicating extreme poverty by 2030 will not be met unless that increases. And global hunger is beginning to arise again, having fallen for many years. So the Secretary General of the United Nations says, it is abundantly clear that a much deeper, faster and more ambitious response is needed to unleash the social and economic transformation needed to achieve the 2030 goals. And if you look each of the 17 goals, there are major problems in some of the targets that are not being met. I'm not going to go through all of them. The world is not on track to end extreme poverty. Millions more people are now living in hunger than they were in 2015. About three and a half million more malaria cases in the uh, countries in Africa which have uh, the worst record of malaria. 
in 2017 compared to 2016. One in five children in the world is still not going to school. 18% of women who have ever had a partner experience physical or sexual violence from that partner in the past 12 months. Three billion people lack clean cooking fuel and technology, etc., etc. Okay, so let's look at the context of the big challenges. So one is the context of environmental sustainability. As you may be aware, uh, not all uh, leaders of the world are particularly keen on uh, uh, environmental policies to reduce climate change. Uh, the uh, President Trump has argued that the concept of global warming was created for, by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing uncompetitive. He said once that it was in line January, it was very cold outside, so global warming can't exist. And he has served notice uh, to quit the uh, Paris Climate Accords. And there are some people who look at some of the data and argue that the climate change is a myth. There's no increased warming trend. So since 1997, if you take the average global warming, it looks like uh, there is not much of a trend in increase in warmth. Now, those of you who know about statistics, the important rule when looking at statistics is not to look at part of the data, but to look at all of the data. When you look at all the data, the trend looks very different. If you just look at the bit in the far right in the red, you may not see a trend increasing. When you look at it in the longer term, then you see a very clear increase in trend in warming. So, if you look at how the world has heated up uh, since pre-industrial levels, which are taken from when records began in 1850, what you see is on average there has been a one degree warming. The scientists have argued that one and a half degrees or maybe two degrees maximum is a danger point for the planet. So we are already halfway there. Sorry. No. Going the wrong way. <laughs> Fourteen of the fifteen hottest years that have uh, since records began have been in the twenty first century. When you look at the longer period over the past thousand years, what you find is that from a thousand years ago until about uh, 18, 1850, there was a trend of decreasing warmth as the Earth uh, moved slightly further away from the sun. But since uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, the increase in temperature is quite marked. This is sometimes called the hockey stick graph because it has the shape of a hockey stick. If you look at the uh, relationship between CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and temperature change as measured in the ice cores over the past uh, 400,000 years, what you see is when the CO2 levels are high, the temperature is high, and when the CO2 levels are low, the temperature is low. The ice core record at the moment goes back 800,000 years, and today there is more CO2 in the atmosphere than at any time for the past 800,000 years. They have recently got an ice core which goes back one and a half million years, and I suspect there is more CO2 in the atmosphere today than the past 1.5 million years. So what are the effects of global warming? Well, you'll get hotter summers and winters, more violent storms because the water cycle speeds up, the glaciers and sea ice will melt, sea level rise will occur because uh, the glacier melts, but also because as the ocean warms up, it expands, and you will get increased volcanic and seismic activity. As you get more water and more rainwater, it lubricates the tectonic plates, and the water puts pressure on the volcanoes and uh, forces the magma up. When you look at... Sorry about this. 
at the Global Trends. This was a, uh, a paper published by 1,500 super scientists recently. Uh, you can't see all these graphs, but what they show is that all the global warming gases have been increasing since uh, the 19, uh, over the past 50 years, since 1980, 1979. Uh, the sea ice is melting, the ocean is becoming more acidic. Um, as the ocean warms up, uh, sea level begins to rise, and as the sea level begins to rise, um, there's more storms, more violent storms. And you can see that all these trends are beginning to accelerate. Now, there are limits to human endurance, physical limits. If the temperature rises above 36 degrees and 100% humidity, you cannot lose heat by sweating and you get heat stroke and die. People cannot survive above a temperature of 36 degrees centigrade and 100% humidity. Now, at the present, nowhere on the planet Earth does that happen. People with the right clothing can survive anywhere on the planet with maybe the exception of the high Arctic plateau, Antarctic plateau. If we burn all the oil and coal in the ground, the temperature is predicted to rise by 10 degrees. That's the reserves we know at the moment, the ones that Exxon and uh, uh, Permex and all these companies' uh, uh, financial security is based upon. Then the areas marked brown and light brown on this map will be areas where it are not able to sustain human life. You will literally not be able to live there because you will die of heat stroke. So that includes a lot of the USA, some of Mexico, a lot of Latin America, a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa, Spain, south of France, a lot of the Middle East, India, large parts of China, large parts of Australia. People who live there will either die or have to move north or south to colder climates. That is a different world to the one we live in today. So, it is really important to prevent business as usual because business as usual will lead to this. So these are the long-term environmental trends that the Sustainable Development Goals need to reverse. Yeah? So that's a big challenge. Of course, if we don't burn all the oil and coal in the ground, then the value of the major oil companies, the major fossil fuel companies, will plunge to zero. And that is a significant problem if you have a pension fund or for many countries' economies, so uh, not, 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 not committing suicide <laughs> by burning all the oil in the ground will have significant financial impact, yeah? So let's look at these social and economic costs and trends. Okay. As you may be aware, in 2008 there was a global financial calamity. These circles represent the wealth of the 50 biggest banks in the planet before the financial crash, and the little black dots represent what they were worth after the financial crash. To put this in context, the UK bank mark number four, uh, its worth before the crash was the size of the GDP of the whole of the United Kingdom's economy for one year. So that circle is equivalent to the size of the GDP of the United Kingdom, which is the sixth largest economy in the world. So the banks gambled and they lost. They lost a lot of money. They lost more money than the GDP of 
the European Union and the United States put together. In order to prevent the whole financial system coming down, the governments of the rich countries had to lend vast sums of money to the banks and then in order to recuperate some of that money they imposed austerity policies. Nevertheless, some of the major banks like Lehman Brothers collapsed. The austerity policies uh, which spread around the world led to unrest in many countries. Here's uh, unrest in Europe and in uh, the Middle East, but I could show you pictures in dozens and dozens of countries. As I said, in order to prevent the whole financial system from collapsing, uh, a rescue package was needed. So uh, the circle on the right is the size of the UK's rescue package, uh, two trillion US dollars. The circle next to it is the size of the UK's GDP, which is a similar size. 100% of GDP was spent on rescuing the financial institutions almost the same in the US and in all the other countries. So the question is, why should the collapse of one bank lead to an almost catastrophic collapse of the global economy? Well, in order to answer that, you need to understand the structure of global capitalism. So there is a database called the Orbis database, which contains details of the 30 million large businesses across the planet in 163 countries. A lot of these businesses are fairly small. They're people who own a shop or uh, a plumbing firm or building firm. Most of the global economy is based on 43,000 transnational corporations. Now, these are often publicly traded, some are private, but there is an ownership structure. If you own the controlling number of shares in a company, you control what that company does. And when you do a network analysis, you find that 80% of the global economy is controlled by just 737 firms. They have a controlling interest. A lot of those firms are major banks, and those major banks have controlling interests in each other. So you can see at the bottom of the uh, circle mark D, uh, Lehman Brothers, which collapsed. And when Lehman Brothers collapse, so then that has a knock-on effect with the other banks that he owns part of, and then that has a knock-on effect with the ownership of all the other transnational companies as the banks try and pull money out of their ownership structure in order to shore up their own business. So the pattern of global capitalism is highly unstable. If one of the big planks is pulled out, then the whole system can begin to crumble. It, the network is very unstable for those who are, talk about network analysis. So that's why a collapse of one bank, Bay, Bay, Lehman Brothers, can lead to a catastrophic cascade across the globe. Okay, but when we want to look at the cause of the crisis, you need to take a longer view and look at the political economy of it. So uh, when you still talk about the global crisis, there's lots of technical terms, credit default swaps, uh, ninja mortgages, subprime mortgages, exotic financial de derivatives, but these are symptoms of the changes in the global economy, not the cause. If you look at the longer view, in the 1960s and 70s, these were times of relative prosperity for working people in many of the rich countries of the world. Labor was a scarce resource and wages um, were reasonably high. In the 1980s and 90s, there were a number of technological changes, ICT, containerization, the introduction of neoliberal governments, which uh, restricted uh, the power of trade unions, and the real share of uh, wages, the amount of money that went to the people rather than to profits and businesses, 
began to decline. Now, this decline in the relative wealth of labour poses a problem for the global economy because if people don't have money to buy the goods that are being produced, how does the global economy keep selling stuff to people? And the answer to that was called securitization. So people began to be offered credit. So when I was a young man, no one had a credit card. Maybe James Bond had one, yeah? the American Express. Yeah. Now everyone has credit cards. Yeah? And in, when I was a young man, it was very difficult to get, buy, get a mortgage to buy a house or a car. You had to save for years with the same bank and apply for it. Now it's much easier. You can get loans for cars. Yeah? So this securitization resulted in household debt rising across uh, the rich countries of the world as, house, as people managed to buy goods and maintain their lifestyle by using borrowed money. Uh, this, the rich became very rich because of this and they invested their money in assets and uh, the resulting speculative bubbles uh, often led to vast changes in the prices of, economy, of commodities and food and oil and that destabilized some countries. It was this system which collapsed and this system hasn't yet changed. <coughs> so just to look, show you What happened, this graph shows the percentage of money that went to the majority of people between the 1960s and uh, 2000. As you can see from the 1960s until about the 1980s, the percent of the global economy in the rich countries, the OECD countries, that went to the people increased from about half of GDP to uh, almost 60% uh, of GDP and it has now begun to decline. Of course, in many parts of the world, in Latin America, the population gets much less of the economy than it does in, say, Western Europe. So in Western Europe, the, the people get about half of the wealth that's created. In Latin America, it's about 40%, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's about 30%. So if the share of the economy that went to the population was increased to European levels or uh, Canadian levels in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of poverty would disappear. Right? It's not just that the economies are bigger in the OECD than they are in, say, many Latin American countries. It's also that the population gets more of that economy. Okay. Sorry. So this increase in inequality as more money was taken in profits uh, uh, by businesses and went to elites has led to a range of political crises. And suddenly in uh, the second half of the 20, uh, since in, in the past few years, politicians have begun to discuss this. So President Obama said inequality is the defining issue of our time. Christian Lagarde, who was managing director of the IMF, said, excessive inequality is corrosive to growth, it's corrosive to society, the economics profession and the policy community have downplayed inequality for too long. Apparently, the IMF believes if only we'd told them inequality was bad, then everything would have been all right. Yeah? And the IMF, uh, the head economist of the IMF has argued that we find that longer growth spells are robustly associated with more equality in the income distribution. Reduced inequality and sustained growth may thus be two sides of the same coin. Okay. So, what the IMF has shown is that where you have redistribution from the majority of the population down to uh, uh, the 60th percentile, that the Gini, uh, the level of inequality, falls by half a percent and uh, growth increases by the same amount. It's not just
the amount of growth that occurs, it's also the length of the growth spell. So the economies tend to go in cycles. What JMF has argued that where you have some redistribution and you have a more equal society, the amount of growth goes up by about half a percent of GDP, but also the length of the growth spells increases. So this shows that if you do redistribute from the bottom 75% to the top 75%, you get a 30% reduction in the duration of growth spells, whereas if you redistribute from the top 25% to the bottom 75% uh, on the right of the graph, you get a 30% increase in the growth spell. So what the IMF argues from these analyses is that reducing inequality leads to more growth and longer spells of growth. The OECD argues similarly. New research shows consistent evidence that the long-term rise in inequality of disposable income observed in most OECD countries has put a significant break on long-term growth. Now, these are not radical Marxist organisations. <laughs> uh, what they're arguing is there needs to be redistribution in order to increase economic growth. Despite what Christian Lagarde believes, this problem has been discussed for quite some time. In 1913, Tawney argued what thoughtful rich people call the problem of poverty thoughtful poor people call with each ju equal justice a problem of riches. Townsend argued the institutions which create or disadvantage the poor at the same time as they create an advantage of the rich are the ones that need to be reconstructed to have a more uh, equal and uh, uh, better society. So what's happened? This graph shows across the income distribution from the poorest 10% to the richest for the USA, Canada, and Western Europe, what has happened to the, who has benefited from the economic growth that's occurred over that 40 year, 35 year period. As you can see, the top 1% in Canada, USA, and Western Europe, captured 28% of all that economic growth. The poorest 50% in these rich countries captured just 9% of that economic growth. So this is what the age of neoliberalism has done and the who has benefited from economic growth. The richest 1% continue to own more wealth than the whole of the rest of humanity. That's the situation today. The wealth of the world's billionaires increased by 900 billion last year, or two and a half billion US dollars a day. Meanwhile, the wealth of the poorest half of humanity, 3.8 billion people, fell by 11%. So last year, the richest 1% saw 900 billion increase to their wealth. The poorest 50% of the population saw a fall. Research by the UK Parliamentary Library on behalf of the legislature in the UK has argued that at the moment uh, the wealthiest 1% own half of the wealth of humanity, but if current trends continue as they have done uh, since uh, 2000, if those trends continue, uh, by 2030, when the Millennium Development, so Sustainable Development Goals are meant to be met, the richest 1% of people on the planet will own two-thirds of the wealth of the planet. Okay. So that's 1% of the population of the world owning two-thirds, 60, 60, 66% of the planet. So to show you an example of what's happened in the USA, uh, this shows who has benefited from economic growth in 1980 and in 2014. On the left are the poorest people, on the right are the richest people. The uh, grey line shows that in 
after 1980, the people who benefited most from economic growth in the USA were the poorest. The rich benefited, but not as much. By 2014, the poorest didn't benefit at all, and it was the richest 1% or fraction of 1% uh, that benefited the most. And this was before the tax cuts under Trump to the richest people. I guess this graph has gone exponential. <laughs> okay, so if the uh, IMF analysis is right and more equal societies have higher economic growth, you would expect in 1980s the US to have had a higher economic growth rate and it was 2.5%. And when the distribution becomes more unequal in 2014, the average growth rate is low. It's exactly what the prediction was uh, from the IMF model. This has meant that in OECD countries, social mobility has seized up. This graph from the OECD shows how many generations it will take on average for someone uh, on the lowest incomes to attain the average income in their society. So for the OECD on average, it's 4.5 generations. If a generation is, say, 20 years, that's almost 100 years. In Colombia, it's 11 generations. So this is how the growth in inequality, the capture of wealth by the world's richest, has led to a seizing up of the chances of mobility. Now, of course, I showed you just the uh, rich countries. If we look at the planet as a whole, what we see is the top 1% captured 27% of the total growth, but that uh, the bottom 40%, 50% captured slightly more in the planet as a whole than they did in just Europe and uh, America. And this was because of the rise of China. So that has had a countervailing force. But nevertheless, the poorest 50% only captured 12% of the growth compared to more than twice that by the richest 1%. That's the global picture. Now, we know inequality is bad for society. So if you look at a whole range of problems, life expectancy, maths and literacy results, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, teenage births, trust in the population, obesity, mental illness, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, social mobility, what you find is the more equal the society in terms of income inequality, the better the result. So it's not just about economic growth, it's about the kind of society you live in. But of course the world is very unequal, uh, this shows uh, the poorest 20% of humanity at the bottom and the richest 20% of humanity at the top, Q5, and you can see the distribution of global income. It doesn't take much uh, redistribution from the top to the bottom to eradicate extreme poverty. Uh, it is measured by $1.25 a day. Yeah, there's, no, there's not a question there being a lack of money in the planet more than enough money. It's a question of the political will. Of course, one of the reasons why it is so difficult to reverse these trends is the amount of money that's flowing out of poor countries, Latin America, Africa, Asia, to rich countries like the United Kingdom or the USA. The bottom line on this graph shows the net outflows of money from poor to rich countries between 2002 and 2014. In 2002, about 200 billion US dollars went from Latin America, Af Africa, and Asia to London, Frankfurt, USA. By 2014, it's a trillion dollars a year, thousand billion. Now, the, this is net flows. It's made up of debt repayment, unfair terms of trade, all kinds of reasons. 
but vast amounts of money are being sucked out of the poorest countries in the world and given to the richest countries of the world to maintain the lifestyle that I and my fellow people in Britain have. Yeah? So this is one of the major problems of, of the structures of the world at the moment in building inequality. So what do I conclude from this reflection? Well, the world is not on track to meet the ambitious SDG goals. Climate change and environmental sustainability problems at the moment are getting worse. Inequality is getting worse. Economic growth in GDP will not solve these problems on its own. And some redistribution both within and between countries is likely to be needed if these sustainable development goals are to be met. So that is the kind of scale of the problem and the nature of the world we live in today. The SDG goals are very ambitious. I sincerely hope they're met, but it's going to take some strong political will from the governments of the world in order to reverse the trends of worsening environment and reverse the trends of worsening inequality, which underpin a lot of the other problems. Thank you very much. Gracias, eh, David. Escuchamos ahora a Gonzalo. Muchas gracias, David. Thank you very much. Quite an interesting uh, point of view. Voy a seguir en inglés por, por respeto a David. Como decía Celia Cruz, my English is not very good looking, but, <laughs> but, but let's, try, let's try, right? Um, So, um, no, so thank you very much. I, I, so I really believe, David, that um, that I mean, having the 2030 agenda, I think it's a good thing. It's, yeah. it's, I mean, it's, it's a great thing. Um, at, at the end of the day, what happened is that many countries got together and had an agreement about about development. So let's say let's say let's let's change the course of the of the world. Let's try to to avoid business as usual, because there are important challenges around, and therefore we have to change what we do. So, there, so therefore, the, the, the agreement was, was very good. Uh, but we have to understand that it was only a political agreement. It doesn't mean that um, the agenda is a technical one, or it doesn't mean that they have in mind the implementation process. I, in fact, when you see the whole agenda, this, I mean, the, what we are aiming to go, uh, and the, a bit of a diagnosis, the agenda is not the diagnosis of a single country specifically. It's just an agreement. And therefore, what we don't have is a clear manual of how, how to implement the agenda. It's a very complex process. Uh, so what, what happens, I mean, so I've been around uh, uh, in some countries and, and I've been part of this group which we wrote the Global Sustainable Development Report 2019 in which we assess what happened to the agenda over the past four years. And so we, we've been witnessing what is happening. And, um, and I see two things. One is... I see people talking about the agenda all the time. Every, everywhere you go, in every country you go, of course, the closer to the UN, uh, more people talk about the agenda. So that's, that's a very good thing. But the other thing I see, or we see, is that honestly, 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 countries and governments are not that aware, are not that clear of how to address the agenda. Because if you recall, there are 17 goals, 169 targets, 248 indicators. And when you have all that, uh, it is overwhelming, actually. And it is not only, it's not only overwhelming, but um, governments still work on silos. Governments are structured in ministries, of secretarias, 
So you have the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of um, the Finance, the Ministry of uh, Health, the Ministry of Health, blah, blah, blah. And you have one person responsible for each ministry. And they have their own goals, and they have their own political agenda. Which means that perhaps they, they may be doing a, a, a really good job, let's say, <laughs> on a separate issues. So one guy is trying to go for growth, which is all right. The other one is trying to, to go for climate change, which is right. But sometimes the things they do together, they clash between each other. And because we, are, we have been divided, the government by silos, then going beyond that is quite difficult. And not only that, so, so, we ha so in this report, what we have quite clearly um, as, as, a, as a statement is that if we don't address, if, we, if countries or global institutions do not address the interlinkages of the goals and the targets, if we don't address the trade-offs in a very clear way, then we perhaps won't be meeting uh, many of the goals and may, maybe we may be doing business as usual. And there are, so, so that, that's a very important thing. So one, one thing that the report says, I'm going to, to say it again, is if we don't address interlinkages and trade-offs on development, if we don't face that every time that there's economic growth, which is right, we are doing, we are doing something harmful, harmful against climate change. If we don't address that we are getting more energy for certain people, but if we are doing that through coal, that's a bad thing. <laughs> uh, if we don't address that, then we won't be meeting the goals and we will be doing business as usual. So that's a very important message from that report. And the other one is, as, they, as David was saying, that over the past four, almost five years, we still have, uh, there are still goals that are not meeting, and it, perhaps like, they go on, on the reverse uh, uh, action. So the increase in inequality is there. The increase in climate change is there. We haven't stopped neither of them. And those are two examples of goals which interlink, interlink to another, to, to many other um, actions that we do. And it's one of the, of the reasons why we haven't deal, we haven't deal with, with them. So it's increasing inequality, um, increasing inequality uh, between groups, climate change, loss of biodiversity, and increase of eye waste, for instance. So we buy mobile service every, every year, and we, we just put it in the, in the bin. But the bin goes somewhere. Uh, and it's uh, somewhere that is uh, harming, harming the, the world. We still have issues with mort maternal mortality, with malnutrition. We do have, at the same time, undernutrition and obesity. We still have deaths by diabetes, alcohol, tobacco. Uh, we still have problems with with water, for instance. And sometimes it seems to me that when, when you talk to people about climate, climate change and the environment, and environment, from my point of view, David, we still think, well, that's, that's so far away. It's just so far away. I mean, we are fine. I mean, today is cold in Mexico City. And say, so, well, what, what, it's not warming up. It's, it's, today is cold, and it's, it's November. So, that thing about climate change and, and the um, warm-up effect is not quite right. It's, it's cold and it's going to be colder in January and they say, well, that, that's not there. Uh, but, but as, as uh, David actually very nicely put it, it is, it is a problem and it's getting worse. Um, and it, so therefore, in, in our, our report, we have some examples of trade-offs. Um, Two, one of them is food and energy, right? Um, I, like, I like eating eating meat a lot, as Fernando 
likes me a lot. <laughs> and I believe even David is. Uh, but, uh, well, it is, it is quite clear from the scientific point of view that if we, if we keep doing that, then we will have a problem. So at the same time, we are trying to, to feed more people the usual way, but perhaps getting food the usual way is going to be harmful for us at the end of the day. So, so, so imagine, imagine telling us, telling the Argentinians, telling the Chileans, you need to reduce your meat intake. That's a big issue, and, and say, well, why don't you tell these things to the Polish or to the Spanish, not to the Argentinians or to the Chileans? Uh, because we believe that someone else has have to do that. They, someone else has to do this, and therefore the, the food element is one of the of the examples that we put on the on the report, saying, well, how can we deal with trying to increase the amount of food? that in some, per, in some places is needed still. Perhaps as a whole, we, don't have, we have enough, as you say. But in some places, some people may need some food. How can we deal with that? And at the same time, trying to change the way we feed ourselves. Um, and of course, the, the other good example, that is obvious, is the energy system. We're trying to increase energy for everyone. How can we, how can we deal with that? together with the issue of trying to produce clean energies and avoid coal, for instance. How can we do that at the same time? And those are the challenges that we face um, a lot. And of, course, and of course, the inequality part that David was saying and the climate change, it's, it's, it's very important. I'm going, to, I'm going to finish, because it's just a brief comment, uh, saying that, two, two things. One is the real challenge for countries, it's how can we seriously deal with the agenda? What I witness is that countries are either they don't know what to do, either they are just doing cosmetic things for the agenda. Uh, every September countries produce a voluntary national report. Many countries are doing that. And when you read the voluntary national reports, what you see is almost Disneyland. <laughs> They're doing so well on the voluntary reports that you say, boy, I want to go there. I mean, I want to go to Somalia and Mexico. It's good. They're doing really good things. And when you go down to the country's actually everyday life on, on, on meeting the agenda, things are not there. So we are showing off for the UN and for the other countries. Uh, sometimes we are linking our own programs to the targets. Uh, and that's very easy. <laughs> I mean, I remember the Secretaria de Hacienda asking us, uh, please link all your programs to all the SDGs. And everybody did that. It was quite simple, you know? And now we have a matrix in Mexico, at least in the previous government, where you have all programs uh, linked to the to SDGs. And it's, I mean, you can do it in, in, in an afternoon. And then, then the Mexican government was saying, now we have an SDG agenda going on. So the very last thing is, how do you combine the country's priorities, which has been there before the agenda? We do have a constitution in Mexico. We have priorities there. How do we combine th those priorities and objectives with a new agenda, new still, and make the most out of, out of both development processes? I think that's a very important process and is not easy at all for no one. Thank you very much. Gracias, eh, Gonzalo. Pues eh, ofrezco la palabra. Queda un sí, y allá. D dice su nombre, por favor. Sí. Uh, 
Um, hello, my name is Ismael. I come from the postgrado in Ciencias de la Sostenibilidad de aquí. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very good. Uh, however, my question is, do you think it is good to keep on doing this global analysis without taking into account the local processes that are still um, up in the air, like these um, political and social differences between and among uh, social groups, uh, countries and regions. And this, and my question goes more to a uh, like cultural and like from the psyche, uh, from the human psyche. So yeah, that's my, that's my question. Um, if, do you think that it, it is good to keep on doing this global analysis without taking into account the local circumstances of the regions? Thank you. Gracias, allá. Hi, Dave. Uh, um, I'm Jedit uh, from Puet. Uh, I would like to add that uh, to achieve the SDGs uh, goals in Mexico, uh, particularly to achieve the first goal, it is not enough to reverse the trend of uh, increasing poverty. Uh, I mean, we require a sustained reduction on poverty because it also, as you said, and Gonzalo said, uh, implies high disparities and inequalities. This is not, uh, to my point of view, an easy issue because the income dimension depends on economic factors and on the context of crisis as well. Um, and there should be appropriate institutional reforms to be prominently outlined in the post-2015 agenda. Uh, what evidence do you know about any national and subnational governments regarding institutional reforms or efforts to reduce poverty? Gracias, Pueden, eh, tenemos grandes traductores aquí, así es de que pueden hablar en, en, en español y le traducen aquí está el doctor Nájera, que nos va a ayudar, este, a, a David este, casi simultáneamente. Uh, hello, my name is Misael, and I'm from, I study economics in the UNAM. Uh, I have two questions. First one is, uh, how can we address uh, policies to reduce environmental CO2 pollution and, st and stuff like that to developed countries. Because if we saw a map of, of CO2 production, the most are in developed countries and not in the, in the developing countries. And the second one is, um, do we need to change, uh, what do we need to change in capitalism to to achieve this better society that you talk about it. Because I, I, I see that we cannot get to that society under the capitalism, because people in the power are going to try to still having that power. And that's my question. Carlo? Eh, hola, ¿qué tal? Eh, soy estudiante aquí del posgrado de Economía y, y bueno, eh, me quedo un poco un, la duda de respecto a… <risa> eh, si podemos co comprender los objetivos del desarrollo de, de, de sostenible como una, un compromiso político, ¿cómo podemos comprender el, o qué rol tendrían que tener los países que están más cercanos a cumplirlo respecto a aquellos que están más lejanos? Porque, por ejemplo, en México hemos trabajado mucho en, en mejorar la educación, pero tenemos restricciones muy fuertes para que esto impacte positivamente en el crecimiento, por ejemplo. ¿no? Entonces, eh, ¿qué tipo de políticas podrían eh, aplicarse en países desarrollados para 
apoyar a los países en desarrollo para eh, alcanzar sus metas. Okay, there's some very good and difficult questions. So, global analysis, uh, is there any point to it when local processes, local culture is obviously critically important? And of course, I agree with you that uh, local processes and cultures are the most important thing of all. However, these are global problems. The atmosphere does not care about your local processes and local cultures. If you add CO2 to it, everyone will suffer. Yeah? So for something like reducing the improving biodiversity or reducing climate change, that has to be done at the global scale. Everyone is involved in this. Uh, local, uh, other things like improving healthcare or maternal mortality, then the local is very important. But the ability to do that, to a certain extent, depends on the global processes in causing climate change, which we need to respond to and will cost a lot of money to respond to. So to give you an example, if the sea level rises, if investments in the cities on the coast in improving the services, when everyone will have to move inland, is not, is the, uh, it will be overwhelmed, yeah? Okay. Poverty reduction and the crisis, are there examples of institutional changes which are happening which will make a difference? Yeah, poverty reduction is uh, important, but there are some good examples of institutional changes that are being attempted. So in 2012 at the ILO, the governments, the representatives of the world, the representatives of employee organizations and the representatives of trade unions in each country that's a member of the International Labour Organization agreed that there should be minimum social protection flaws, that there should be pensions for older people, there should be protections for working age people, uh, there should be money for disabled people in the social welfare system, and there should be social protection for children. So that is the first time there has ever been a global agreement amongst virtually all the countries in the world in order to target uh, social welfare and social security benefits in order to ensure that there's adequate money across the dangers of the life course. Countries have agreed to that, and that would be a major institutional change if they implement that. That will have a significant effect on reducing global poverty. We know from uh, a long history that welfare states where you have comprehensive social security coverage, you tend to have lower poverty rates. Uh, an example in, say, the European Union, which covers 550 million people, is they are developing a universal child guarantee, which will guarantee all children in the European Union uh, right to adequate food, education, health care, and other serv and housing services. So again, they are trying to make widespread international change across uh, a number of countries. So it's not entirely pessimistic. There are things we know how to do. Yeah? Okay, what can be done to reduce CO2 and uh, particularly in the current form of capitalism? I agree with you, the current form of capitalism is a, a problem. Um, a few years ago, I found out uh, that I paid more tax personally than Facebook does in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, I am an academic, not a millionaire. <laughs> I don't pay that much tax, but Facebook was paying no tax, and that's a multi-billion dollar corporation. Yeah? That seems to me to be something that could easily change even within the current forms of capitalism. And it's not just in the UK, Facebook doesn't pay tax. Yeah? There are major corporations, transnational corporations, which are not paying the taxes they should do. And that can change. You know, that's just a question of enforcing laws and having international agreements. Yeah? 
in order to reduce the CO2 emissions, there does need to be a fundamental change in the, the way we move in transport, the way we drive, we need to move to electric vehicles, uh, and the way energy is generated. So, I, in Mexico, I think, is planning to build another coal-fired power station. That is going the wrong way. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to have a, generate, and also, Coal-fired power stations are relatively expensive compared to the co reducing cost of solar power, wind power, hydroelectric power. Uh, governments of the world need to stop subsidising fossil fuel. In the past 10 years, the subsidies for oil extraction and coal extraction have effectively doubled in the OECD countries. They need to be set to zero, and then uh, renewable energy will become much more uh, attractive. Yeah? And again, that can change, e uh, that has to change within, even within the current form of capitalism. What role do developed countries have in helping developing countries? Well, since the 1960s, the rich countries of the world have agreed to spend 0.7% of their GNI on overseas aid. The UK is one of the few countries in the world that does that, along with Nordic countries and the Netherlands. Since the 1960s, the wealth of the rich countries has got trebled, and yet they're still not fulfilling the promises they have made repeatedly. So the first thing they can do is actually fulfill the promises they've made for 60 years. But of course, the major problem is the outflow of a trillion dollars a year from the poor countries to the rich countries. So, as I said, my country uh, has met its agreements at last, and uh, the previous government, the Prime Minister, was very proud that in one year the amount of overseas aid money going to sub-Saharan Africa was doubled, and that's the UK's a big economy, that was quite a lot of money. But to put that in perspective, in one week, Nigeria paid the UK more in debt service repayment than the whole of the aid budgets to sub-Saharan Africa for a year. So the scale of the cash flows are huge. And countries in the rich worlds of the world need to have fairer rules and regulations to stop exploiting the poor countries. Otherwise, you will just see this continued growth in inequality. So, there are my answers. Thank you for those very helpful and important questions. I mean, I, mean, I, I, would, I would only just uh, say that I mean, development and all the goals we have in development, either is SDGs or not, but I mean, development as a whole is, is, is quite complex. It's always, been, it's always been quite complex. So if we want to address the 289 indicators at the same time, it's going to be crazy. So I, I really prefer to see steps in development with priorities. I always compare this to El Boliche, the El bowling strategy. So in, 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 bowling, in, the, in bowling, in El Boliche, you have to, to tackle 10 pins with only two shots. You don't have one million shots, it's only one shot, two shots for 10 pins. So the idea is how do you direct the, sh the shots or how do you put your pins in order to address as many as possible with only two shots? So governments have limited resources every year from now until 2030. So the idea is how do you accommodate your pins, your development pins, in order to make the most out of the agenda and your own development? Uh, I really believe that addressing inequality, addressing climate change, addressing, uh, and it has to do with energy decarbonization and, and universal access, addressing sustainable and just, just economies, just selecting a couple three, four, five elements with their interlinkages, I think if we, if we can do that as, uh, as, uh, as countries and as a whole, if we 
just try to to select like from the a subset of the agenda with crucial elements that will be much better than trying to address the whole thing at the same time which is why i i fear that countries are trying to do sometimes can i just sure. add sure. so i i hope i know what i've said has been very depressing but i <laughs> I don't want you to go away, I mean, I'm an optimist, so I want you to go away thinking there's nothing that can be done. Yeah? So to give you an example of what can be achieved by people taking action, in 1996 there was a retired politics lecture teaching an adult education class to eight pupils and telling similar stories to what I've been telling tonight. And his pupils said, well, this is terrible, you know, these, all these countries in Africa having to pay huge debts they can't pay, children are dying, we should do something about it. So he said, okay, if you're interested, we'll try. And they set up the Jubilee 2000 campaign to try and get the governments of the world to write off the debts to the poorest countries uh, who can't possibly pay those debts. Within two years, 20 million people in 160 countries had signed up to this campaign and within five years hundreds of billions of dollars in debt had been written off from the poorest countries which led to a massive improvement in those countries from a very low level in life expectancy, reduction in poverty, improvement in healthcare. And that was a lecture on a rainy day in the winter in one group of nine people. So you can achieve a lot of things if you're prepared to take some action. I'll leave you with those thoughts. Muchas gracias, David. Thank you very much. Gracias, Gonzalo. Bueno, yo utilizo la primera conclusión de David. El mundo no está en la dirección de eh, lograr los objetivos ambiciosos de, de la agenda. Y el crecimiento económico, en, en, medio por el PIB, por sí solo no resolverá estos problemas. Y luego nos agrega, es decir, quiero demostrar que yo puedo ser más pesimista que David y que Gonzalo. Y, y Gonzalo nos dice, bueno, es que eh, los gobiernos, o por lo menos este gobierno de este país, no está organizado para abordar tareas que podrían, para resumirlas, podemos llamarlas sistémicas, que implican entender y traducir en acción el principio básico de nuestra disciplina, que es la inter interdependencia. Si no se asume la interdependencia como, como el elemento dominante de la realidad económica, política y social, no se actúa en congruencia con esa realidad. Y los gobiernos no están organizados para eso, sino más bien para lo contrario, ¿no? para profundizar en esta segmentación. Y bueno, si vemos más a fondo el tema y pasamos revista a lo que hace y puede hacer la Organización de las Naciones Unidas, o ahora ya el Banco Mundial y el Fondo Monetario Internacional, para no mencionar a la Organización Mundial de Comercio, que quién sabe dónde está, pues lo que podemos decir es que el mundo no está preparado para encarar estas estas eh, tareas, que son tareas que emanan de un uh, entendimiento más o menos profundo y científico de las necesidades que, que la propia realidad ha generado. Bueno, abandono el optimismo y entonces digo, entonces lo que necesitamos es diseñar pronto una agenda, uno para entender la agenda, es decir, para entenderla como una realidad en acción, 
y no como una enumeración de buenos deseos. Y dentro de esta agenda, para entender la agenda, pues tendríamos que aprender algo de movimientos como el que ahora eh, ha encarnado la niña o ex niña Greta de Suecia, o lo, en, lo encarna cada semana Jane Fonda en las eh, escaleras del Capitolio. Eh, yo leí un libro hace años en donde su autor se llama Paul Hawken, eh, dice que siendo un activista en materia de cambio climático, encontró al movimiento más grande de la historia y del mundo, que es el movimiento eh, ambientalista y, y ahora contra el cambio climático. Y es un movimiento que nadie ha organizado, que se ha ido organizando. Y el libro se llama Bendito sea, el, el, Bendita sea la inquietud, Blessed on Rest. Pues quizás eso es lo que tengamos que interiorizar para traducir la agenda en función de la auténtica profunda realidad del mundo. Pues habrá que intentarlo por lo menos desde aquí. Thank you very much again, David. And uh, muchas gracias, Gonzalo. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to speak to such a knowledgeable audience. Thank you. Un momento.